The Beastie Boys album, Check Your Head, was not only a pivotal moment for the band themselves, but also for the hip-hop genre in general. It saw the band finally establish their identity after a huge roller coaster start to their career. Back in 1986, the Beastie Boys introduced themselves with License to Ill. Led by their biggest hit from the album, Fight for Your Right to Party, they created alter egos that could be loud, obnoxious, but also intriguingly fresh to a new generation of kids that were experiencing hip-hop for the first time. This approach made them a huge worldwide success commercially, but it wasn't without its downsides. Not only was there a backlash from the press, but the boys became increasingly tired of trying to live up to this persona and needed a break. After a short hiatus and a change of record company from Def Jam to Capital, they relocated to LA, where they eventually hooked up with the Dust Brothers to create the incredible Paul's Boutique album. Although rightfully, this has gone down as a true classic, it wasn't an initial success, as the new record company Capital failed to promote the album properly and instead decided to focus on Donny Osmond's new offering. It was a strange realisation for them, as they were used to success and they were confident with what they had with Paul's Boutique, so to see it bomb in comparison to License to Ill was a tough thing to take. During the making of Paul's Boutique, they hooked up with engineer and producer Mario Caldato Jr., better known as Mario C. Mario would become key to the whole creative approach in making Check Your Head, Coming off the back of the disappointing sales of Paul's Boutique, the band really didn't want to rap anymore, and instead decided to pick up their instruments again and get back to their days as a hardcore band that first flourished on the New York scene in the early 80s. Their taste had diversified quite a bit since those days though, and they were really into organ-driven jazz such as Groove Holmes and Jimmy Smith, the funk of the meters and the dub reggae vibes of Lee Scratch Perry. Serendipity would lend a help in hand one day when Mike D crashed his car into the gate of the rented home they named the G-Spot. It just so happened that Mario C's childhood friend Mark Nishita was a carpenter and could help out with fixing the gate, which was handy, but more importantly for their career, he was also an ace musician and the organ player they needed to complement their lineup for funk jams after he fixed their fence of course. Still completely instrumental at this stage, the group started jamming at Ad-Rock's apartment. Not surprisingly, the neighbours took objection to this, so they set up in an LA rehearsal room. It was at this stage that Mario began to record these jams, very simplistically at first with two PZM microphones into a DAT machine for stereo recording. The PZM mics were originally designed to work in an office conference setting, as they operate by minimising phase interference between the source sound and the reflected room sound. As a result, they tend to even out the recordings, so a great choice by Mario. So great in fact, that the song Something's Got To Give features one of these two-track recordings as the basis for the whole song, with additional overdubs performed later. Their enthusiasm for what they were creating inspired Mike D to find a more permanent place to set up the band. He found a place in Atwater Village, LA, later named G-Sun, that fit their bill perfectly. It had an old ballroom that they could use for a live room. It still even had a stage that they initially set the drums up on. The space was so big that they were able to cram a skateboard halfpipe plus a half basketball court. The control room was quite a bit more crammed, however, although they did manage to fit in a 32-channel Neotech Elan console and the 24-track Tascam ATR80. The outboard gear wasn't anything too exotic. DBX 160s and Yamaha GC2020 compressors, reverb also from Yamaha with a Rev7 and SPX90, which were pretty cheap even then. For the drum microphones, they had the Sennheiser 421s on the kick and toms, Shaw SM57s on the top and bottom of the snare, AKG C460s for the overheads, and the AKG C451s on their hi-hat. Norman U47s were also used as room mics in the giant ballroom. The SM57s were also used for miking the guitar amps, mainly Fender Deluxe and Jazz Chorus, but also Marshalls for the heavier stuff. The Sennheiser 421 was used for the bass amp along with the direct sound. Unusually, Ad-Rock often favoured cheaper guitars like the Hondo 2 seen here. And for guitar pedals, both bass and guitar, it remained unusual also, and they were huge fans of the idiosyncratic Maestro W2 pedal made by Gibson in the late 60s. This bizarre box featured a drum machine along with the extreme EQ boost and most used effect, the fuzz. 
This fuzz would find its way onto a lot of Yauch's bass recordings. Hey, yo, yo, what's up with your fuzz terminator? Oh, it's funny you should ask, because I have the switch right here, right? Right. Equipment such as the Maestro W2, Echoplex tape delay, Mutron biphase were already becoming vintage by the early 90s, and the Beasties became obsessed with seeking out old instruments and effects that their musical inspirations used back in the 70s. Through junk shops and the local ad named The Recycler, they were able to pick up classics like the Fender Rhodes electric piano, the Honor clavinet, and the Roland Space Echo for that dub vibe, and the Wah Wah pedals for funk. Spring Reverb was also another key ingredient for that dub vibe, and for that they had the Pioneer SR202. This little unit was intended to be used in a hi-fi setting rather than the studio, but its character was unusual and lo-fi, which fitted perfectly for their sound. A full year and a half had passed recording these instrumentals, and Mario had amassed hundreds of hours of jams, which they then started to dissect and pick out sections either to loop or to form the basis of a song. The looping and sampling was done with the EMU SB1200 and the Akai MPC60, which was used mostly for sequencing. The 12-bit nature of these samplers are a defining tone for the hip-hop sounds of this era. The crunchiness of these breakbeats were unavoidable due to the primitive sampling technology of the low bit and sample rates they offered while trying to maximise sample time. Coupled with this, the preamps also play a big part in the overall sound too, and when pushed will saturate and compress the incoming signal. Luckily, this sounded great, and these units still fetch a fair price due to their unique character. I have an Akai S900 and S950 that I use from time to time to get that unmistakable crunchy vibe. It was at this time that the no rapping embargo was lifted when MCA approached Mario with an idea he had for a track featuring a Jimi Hendrix sample, which became the song Jimmy James. He was so nervous about performing the track though, that he asked to track the vocals at Mario's home studio that featured an 8-track ADAP machine. The track was then presented to the rest of the boys the next day and met with unequivocal enthusiasm, prompting a change of course for an album that now started to take form. The lo-fi Anything Goes vibe was epitomised by the choice of mic for the track, So What You Want. Behold, the Sony Variety karaoke microphone, with built-in pitch shift and everything. Everything except fidelity, of course. And this is exactly what they loved about it. It essentially had a built-in distortion effect, although all the effects were switched off when they used it. It was just that bad, and in that way, perfect. They used a range of other microphones for vocals, including the SM58, the Sennheiser 421, Mostly handheld mics, but sometimes the AKG 414. Definitely no fixed routine for this part of the recording. So now they had hardcore, jazz funk and hip hop all going on. This range of styles on one album is daring and original, but it represented their taste in music and personalities to a T. One of their key ways to get inspired was to listen to music and then go and play something like it and make it their own. Groove Homes is a great example of this. Inspired, of course, by the classic mid-70s jazz funk albums made by the title's namesake. In total, it took three years to make Check Your Head, and in that time, the Beasties had created a whole new identity for themselves, traversing both a hip-hop and indie band scene alike. The rap-rock group concept would become commonplace just a few years later, but this album definitely paved the way and remains a timeless classic. <laughs> 